Well, this afternoon's uh, lecture will will connect in some sense to what I said this morning, uh, particularly on the the basis that, of course, faith for classic Protestantism is not what it is generally understood to be today by the wider culture. I was talking to somebody the other week who was uh, attending with a relative, uh, uh, a group that was dealing with with addiction. This person has a relative who is suffering from an addiction and had asked if they would go along to the, uh, the sort of rehabilitation group to which he belonged. And the, the, the lady I was talking to was very struck by the fact that while she was a Christian and wanted to talk about her faith in God, uh, she was not allowed to do that at this meeting, that the emphasis in the meeting was on faith, but it was on faith, not on faith in something else. And I think that captures perhaps in an extreme form what one encounters continually uh, throughout the culture today, that faith is definitely seen as a virtue. People like faith, but generally speaking, it's not faith in something. It's a kind of nebulous concept that everything perhaps will turn out well in the end, or faith is that which motivates you to get out of bed in the morning or to put your life back on the right tracks. Faith for the Reformers was something much more deep and radical than that. And what I want to do this afternoon is really what I tried to do this morning relative to Scripture, and that's bring out the importance of the issue of faith by looking at a particular theological conflict in which the importance of faith and the nature of faith was brought out in sharp relief. And that, of course, as already been alluded to just now, is the controversy of the Reformation, particularly Martin Luther's contribution to that. But in order to understand Luther, Luther's understanding of faith and justification, it's necessary that we understand something of the background against which Luther was working, in which he'd been educated, and against which he was reacting. Now, Luther uh, was trained as a medieval theologian. Start of the 16th century, a number of universities in Europe were moving in a more, what we might call, Renaissance direction. Men like Erasmus, we talked about him this morning, they were having an effect on the way people were being educated, but not Luther. Luther, although he was born in some ways at the very start of the modern age, Luther had a fairly impeccable medieval uh, education. And he was trained in a theological school called in Latin the Via Moderna, or in English we could call it the modern way. And the modern way was a a late medieval development of uh, theological themes that had been hashed out in earlier times. We could perhaps uh, summarize uh, pre-Reformation understandings of justification by saying that generally speaking, Medieval theologians understood justification as based upon the actual transformation of people. In other words, you were justified if you were made righteous in some way. God declared those to be righteous who actually were so, or who at least started the process of moving towards a fully consummated, perfect righteousness. Justification, in other words, was a process, and it involved real change. One of the great uh, theologians of the Middle Ages, uh, a man who is actually delightful to read on a whole host of topics, even in those areas where he perhaps got things wrong, was uh, Thomas Aquinas. It's very difficult to understand modern Catholicism without reading Aquinas. And actually, it's very difficult to understand 17th century Protestantism without reading Aquinas. 17th century Protestants liked Aquinas too. When Aquinas wrote on justification, he saw justification as this change that was brought about within individuals as a result of the infusion, as he saw it, of habits of grace through the sacraments. Basically, you would attend the Mass and in in eating the uh, bread and drinking the wine or partaking of the body and the blood, uh, something passed into you that actually served to change you, change your substance, if you like, and to make you more righteous. So when God declared you to be justified, it was because there'd been an actual change, one might say, in your very being. 
Now, Luther was not trained as a, as a follower of Thomas Aquinas. He was trained in this modern way. And the modern way, uh, the, the theologians of the modern way had uh, a, a profound sense of the mysterious otherness of God. And they were very concerned about imposing upon God criteria from human reason that may not be applicable to him. So when it came to justification, whereas Thomas was very comfortable arguing that in order for a man to be declared righteous, he must actually be righteous, the theologians of the modern way thought that that was extrapolating too much from human reason, that actually God could declare somebody to be righteous or justified who was not actually so. What they did was they inserted a little condition. They were concerned that in making that statement, they would uh, open the way for immorality. If you don't have to actually be righteous to be declared righteous, why should one try to live a moral life by saying, well, what God does is He will declare you righteous not on the basis of some intrinsic righteousness that you have, but on the basis that you've done your best. It's pastorally quite a, a brilliant idea in some sense in that, uh, you know, your best might be different to my best. You might be that much more upright a person than me. And for you, doing your best might be saying 20 Hail Marys in a day. But because I'm a lazy blighter and I get out of bed an hour later, doing my best might be just saying 10. The important thing is that for the theologians of the modern way, the men who were training Luther, God would look down on each individual and would say, yes, that person has done their best. Therefore, they will merit the first infusion of grace that then triggers this process whereby they can actually become righteous. The important thing for Luther, for understanding Luther is, an important break has been made there. An important break has been made between somebody's actual state and God's declaration of who and what they are. For Aquinas, you've got to be righteous, actually be righteous for God to say you're righteous. For the theologians of the modern way, no, you just got to do your best. Your best might not really be very meritorious in and of itself at all, but within this scheme that God had set up, you could be declared to be righteous. Martin Luther was trained in this, uh, in this theology, and for a while it worked for him until finally he became haunted. He became haunted by the fact that he could never know that he'd done his best. If you think about it, the pastoral brilliance of the modern way solution is also its Achilles heel. Yeah, if you do your best, God will be gracious to you. But how can you know you've done your best? And this lethal Achilles heel drove Luther in on himself. And he spends uh, much of the uh, early part of the second decade of the 16th century wrestling with the book of Psalms and the letters of Paul, trying to come to some deeper understanding of the human condition and why it is that this theology has proved unsatisfactory to him. And by 1518, we often think Luther launches his Reformation campaign in 1517. If you've ever read the 95 Theses on Indulgences, you'll understand what I'm about to say. And I know Steve Nichols has, has republished them, and this is not an indictment of Steve, though he did have a shot at me in the first lecture, so it's payback time. The 95 Theses Against Indulgences, even in the edition that Steve Nichols has produced, is an incredibly tedious piece of work. And unless you have a good grasp of medieval theology, you will not understand them. There is very little that one might describe as distinctively Protestant in the 95 Theses Against Indulgences. Luther had actually said more radical things before, and nobody had paid a blind bit of attention to it. And it's really April 1518 where Luther's thinking on justification and faith starts to accelerate and take on a more mature form. In April 1518, Luther presides over a disputation in the city of Heidelberg, where his monastic order, the Augustinians, are having their annual chapter meeting. Luther's prepared a series of theses for debate, which he gives to a junior colleague, Leonard Beyer, and he presides over this disputation. And it's in the theses of the Heidelberg disputation that we really see Luther's thinking 
on faith and justification starting to emerge. And the very last thesis, I'm going to come back to the Heidelberg Disputation a couple of times today, but the very last thesis of the Heidelberg Disputation, Thesis 28, really captures Luther's theology at this point in a nutshell, and is, I think, among one of the most beautiful extra-canonical Christian statements in the history of the church. The thesis reads as follows, the love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. I'll read it again and then I'll explain it. The love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. In other words, what Luther's saying is this. Human love is responsive. Those of you who are married, why did you fall in love with your spouse? Because you saw something intrinsic, intrinsically beautiful and lovely in your spouse that you were attracted to. And that's how human love works, by and large. We see some quality in an object, and we move towards it in love. Even our children, we might say, well, love for children is very natural, but ultimately, it's driven by the intrinsic quality that they are our children. You sometimes read these terrible stories of people whose babies have got mixed up in the hospital, and suddenly they realize that the child that they love, and they maybe had for several years, is not their child, and things immediately change. Human love is built upon a perception of something intrinsically attractive in the object of love. What Luther's saying here is that divine love is of a different order. Divine love does not find that which is lovely to it. Divine love creates that which is lovely to it. And here Luther puts his finger on what he sees, I think, uh, as the great flaw in medieval theology and we're going to explore this flaw in more detail during this lecture. But the great flaw in medieval theology can perhaps be summed up this way. Human beings assume that God thinks like them only more perfectly. What Luther's arguing here is not that God thinks like human beings any more perfectly. God doesn't declare people righteous because he sees them to be a bit righteous and says, great, I'll declare that person righteous. God's thought, according to Luther here, is of an entirely different order. He doesn't find a lovely object and love it. He finds an unlovely object and makes it lovely. So remember that thesis 28 of the Heidelberg Disputation. Earlier on in that same disputation, thesis 25, he says the following, he is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. And here we get the connection with faith coming in. He is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. Remember, of course, if you think that God thinks like you, then you think justification is going to function as human relations function. Somebody upsets me. Somebody crosses me. Yeah, I'm the dean at Westminster. If somebody crosses me, they could be in serious trouble. And I know when a faculty member turns up in my office and sheepishly starts to say nice things about me, they've probably done something bad that I'm about to find out about. And they're trying to make themselves attractive to me to ameliorate the consequences of their actions. If you think about God in those terms, then sure, something approximating justification by works is going to make sense. We've crossed God. We've sinned against God. What do we have to do? We have to make amends. But Luther says this in his commentary on Thesis 25. Uh, it's an extended quote. You have to bear with me. The righteousness of God is not acquired by means of acts frequently repeated, as Aristotle taught, but it is imparted by faith. For he who through faith is righteous shall live, Romans 1.17. And man believes with his heart, and so is justified, Romans 10.10. 10. Therefore, I, have, I wish to have the words without work understood in the following manner. 
Not that the righteous person does nothing, but that his works do not make him righteous. Rather that his righteousness creates works. For grace and faith are infused without our works. After they have been imparted, the works follow. Thus, Romans 3.20 states, No human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law. And, for we hold that man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, Romans 3.28. In other words, works contribute nothing to justification. Therefore, man knows that works which he does by such faith are not his but God's. For this reason, he does not seek to become justified or glorified through them, but seeks God. His justification by faith in Christ is sufficient to him. Christ is his wisdom, righteousness, etc. As 1 Corinthians 1.30 has it, that he himself may be Christ's action and instrument. A couple of things there just to note in passing before we move on. What Luther's talking about here in terms of faith is far, far from this idea, the sort of the Oprah Winfrey, well, I just got to have faith. I just got to screw my inner courage up and assume that everything's going to turn out okay, even though my life's a train wreck. That's not faith. For Luther, faith is clearly linked to Christ. And as Christ comes through the words of Scripture, there's clearly a link to Scripture there, the promises of Christ in Scripture. And secondly, we could also extrapolate from that and say, faith is clearly linked to a complete inversion of human expectations about God. Faith isn't just, if you like, trusting that the picture we've drawn of God in our minds is the correct one. That's stupidity. Faith is coming to acknowledge that God is nothing like we imagine him to be, and just as he's revealed himself to be. So faith has a definite locus or a definite content to it. It's not simply a sort of nebulous trust. It's closely connected to Christ, it's closely connected to Scripture, and it's closely connected to the complete overturning of human projections of who God is and what He's like. This development in Luther's thinking, this, this importance of faith and this, uh, you know, its antithesis to works, if you like, is linked to other developments in Luther's thinking. Clearly, he doesn't wake up one morning and suddenly have this breakthrough. He doesn't talk about his Reformation breakthrough till 1545, the year before he dies. And then he's thinking of events that happened 30 years earlier, and we know from the chronology he gives us that his account of this breakthrough is nonsense. He's got to have got it wrong. No, a series of things have happened in Luther's mind in the previous decade that have brought him to this position. First of all, his understanding of sin has changed. He'd been brought up by his medieval masters to think of sin as, as the technical term is fomes, a piece of tinder. We might say a weakness, a tendency. Sin is that which means that in certain uh, circumstances you'll find yourself doing things you don't want to do, acting with moral insanity. It's this weakness. And if you think about, uh, if you have that view of sin, then it will impact how you understand baptism and it will understand how you impact justification. If you think of sin as a weakness or, you know, dirt, if you like, being dirty, then baptism will become a healing or a cleansing. And justification will become the process of healing or cleansing. Well, what Luther comes, uh, Luther comes to the conclusion sometime around about 1515, 1516, he comes to the conclusion that he's been taught wrong about sin and about baptism. Sin is not a piece of tinder. It's not a wound. It's not a weakness. Sin is death. And as soon as you start thinking of sin as death, of course, any notion of justification by works goes out the window. Dead bodies don't work. He comes to think of sin as death. He comes to think of baptism not as a washing or a healing, but as a resurrection. And of course, he comes to understand more and more the seriousness of sin and the need for God to take the absolute initiative. You can't work your way up to heaven. Heaven has to descend to earth in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. We go back to the Heidelberg Disputation. 
and see how some of this works out now in the Heidelberg Disputation. Elsewhere, Luther makes an important con uh, contrast between what he calls theologians of glory and theologians of the cross. Uh, thesis 19, 20, and 21 read as follows. That person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. He deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering in the cross. A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Somewhat strange vocabulary to us now. I think uh, what you need to do when you, when you hear those sentences is connect them to Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You think about church in Corinth. It's, uh, my favorite New Testament letter is 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's an amazing church in Corinth. When you think about it, just, as, just to go off on a tangent at the moment, we tend to zero in on all of the, the sexual problems and the immorality in the Corinthian church. This was a church built in the kind of the Las Vegas of the ancient world. The amazing thing is not that there were sexual problems in the church. The amazing thing is that there was a church there in the first place. And when Paul himself in that first chapter says, the first two chapters says, you know, not many of you were good and powerful. What he's actually saying is, many of you are the scum of the earth. He probably came in from the sex trade, many of these people. It's not surprising, having lived those lives, that the kind of problems we see later in 1 Corinthians bubble up. So, Corinthians, it's amazing that there's a church there in the first place. Secondly, you know, it's amazing that Paul, you know, the size of the Corinthian church, it was maybe 70 people. I think real encouragement that the church I go to, where I'm on session, we have maybe 85 to 90 people on a Sunday. It's a great encouragement to me, though, that Paul wrote a letter to a church that was racked with more problems than we have, was smaller than the church I attend, and yet Paul was able to call that church the body of Christ, or the temple of the Holy Spirit, the meaning of history. What an incredibly arrogant thing from a human perspective that was. And that brings me back to what Luther is saying here. If you were to look at the Corinthian church, what would you see? You'd see 60 or 70 people, many of whom were absolute lowlifes that frankly you'd have, you probably wouldn't even have walked down the same street as them. If you had done, you'd have crossed the road to avoid them. And yet Paul calls them the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. What's Paul doing there? He's seeing that church through the eyes of faith. Faith for Luther as it was for Paul, is not simply reducible to trust. It involves a whole approach to reality. And Paul articulates that, of course, in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, where he says, uh, the cross is foolishness. And then you'll notice how he goes on from that. He said, you know, the cross is foolishness, and it's an offense. And you guys, it's very fortunate that that's the case, because you're a demonstration of that kind of logic. You are nobodies, and yet the Lord has made you into a church, and you're the body of Christ, even with all the filth and sleaze in your church. Paul's writing there through the framework of the cross, and that's what Luther's talking about here. When he talks about the theologian of the cross, he means somebody who looks at reality through the framework of God's revelation. That is an important aspect of faith. Faith is not simply nebulous trust. You can't really talk about faith in some ways without talking about its content. And the content of faith is looking at reality through the framework of the cross. The cross itself, of course, is a supreme example of this. Think of the account in Luke's Gospel. Four responses that morning, uh, sorry, that day to, to Christ's crucifixion. The religious leaders, the soldiers, the first thief, all of them theologians of glory. We can be very hard on the first thief. He is being crucified. It's in, you know, going through incredible pain. Of, of the three groups that get the cross wrong, humanly speaking, he has the most excuse. But what do they all say? They all say, Christ, if you are the king, come down from your cross. 
They can only conceptualize the kingdom or kingship in terms of Christ actually coming down from the cross and escaping from death. The second thief on the cross, and incidentally, this goes to the question about relevance yesterday. The second thief on the cross, when you enter your kingdom, remember me. He understands that death is not a bar to the kingdom, but Christ's death is the passage to the kingdom. He's not thinking in human terms. He's not thinking in theologian of glory terms. He's thinking with the eyes of faith. By the way, and I was, uh, again, one of my tasks at my church is I teach the very little kids. Um, my wife and I do a craft with them each Sunday, and we teach them a memory verse. And, you know, it's very tempting sometimes as a, as a teacher of little kids to, to wonder how much of it really sinks in. You know, because you see the kids grow up, and you see them wander away, and, I, and you wonder, well, was it relevant ultimately? You've got to ask yourself with that second thief on the cross, when did he learn this stuff? I don't think you just suddenly realize that God was incredibly holy uh, and that the death he's suffering is nothing compared to the trouble the other side of the grave that he could be facing and that Christ's kingdom is inaugurated through death. I don't think he just thought that up while he was hanging on the cross. I think his time and potential for reflecting upon theology was pretty limited at that point. I think he was taught it when he was a kid. When you ask yourself, well, how relevant was it? Well, even he tells you he deserves to hang on a cross. It was of no relevance whatsoever to his life up until the point when it was the only thing of any relevance, the moment that he came to die. So I take great encouragement with that. And those of you, as a word for you, if you work with youth and with kids uh, and you wonder how much goes in, remember that second thief on the cross. You cannot judge the relevance of what you teach until the person's dead. It's a rather grim way of putting it. But the bottom line is that's the truth. So then, the theology of the cross. And it ties in with, with Luther's understanding of justification. Thesis 26 and 27 of uh, the Heidelberg Disputation, he says this, the law says do this and it is never done. Grace says believe in this and everything is already done. Actually, one should call the work of Christ an acting work and our work an accomplished work and thus an accomplished work pleasing to God by the grace of the acting work. Here we see the counterintuitive logic of the cross applied to the very being of God and salvation. We noted Thesis 28, God's love is not responsive to that which is already lovely, but is creative, making an unlovely object into that which is an object of love. God's love is therefore fundamentally different to that of human beings. And this is the foundation for Luther's understanding of justification. The righteous one is not one who works righteousness as the medieval appropriation of Aristotelian notions of righteousness assumed. Uh, Luther's notion of righteousness is it is something that is given to us by God through faith. Just think, next time you try to explain this to somebody and they say, but that isn't fair. What do they mean by that? What they mean by that is, that is not fair according to human criteria of fairness, where you get what you deserve, or at least we hope other people get what they deserve. We generally assume we should get slightly better than we deserve ourselves. But that's a theo theology of glory in operation. That's not the logic of faith. It's not the logic of the Bible. And of course, if you haven't got faith, it makes no sense. It is only within the context of faith that the logic of the cross actually works. We go on then, we can move on and, and see some of the practical implications of Luther's understanding of justification. Perhaps the, the best work, and I think you can get this, almost certainly get it somewhere for free on the internet. 1520 treatise, The Freedom of the Christian Man. Here Luther articulates both the basis for justification and its ethical implications in great detail. Again, this touches a little bit perhaps on what we talked about last night with the, the lordship salvation debate. On the former, on the basis of justification, Luther talks about something he calls the joyful exchange 
of righteousness and sin which takes place between Christ and the believer when the latter is united to Christ by faith. He says this, the third incomparable benefit of faith is that it unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. By this mystery, as the apostle teaches, Christ and the soul become one flesh. And if they are one flesh and there is between them a true marriage, indeed the most perfect of all marriages, since human marriages are but poor examples of this one true marriage, it follows that everything they have, they hold in common, the good as well as the evil. Accordingly, the believing soul can boast of and glory in whatever Christ has as though it were its own, and whatever the soul has, Christ claims as his own. Let us compare these and we shall see inestimable benefits. Christ is full of grace, life, and salvation. The soul is full of sins, death, and damnation. Let faith come between them, and sins, death, and damnation will be Christ's, while grace, life, and salvation will be the soul's. For if Christ is a bridegroom, he must take upon himself the things which are his bride's and bestow upon her the things that are his. If he gives her his body and very self, how shall he not give her all that is his? And if he takes the body of the bride, how shall he not take all that is hers? Just notice there, when Luther talks about this all happens through faith. Through faith you're united to Christ. Through faith your sins pass to Christ and are dealt with on the cross. And in a miraculous way, Christ's righteousness passes to you. But notice what that does to faith. And what it does is this. I think it puts faith in its place. Faith in itself is not meritorious. You're not saved because of your faith here. You're saved because of the righteousness you receive as a result of that faith. And again, I think that takes us a healthy step away from modern notions of faith. Faith is this nebulous trust. And somehow if you've got this nebulous trust in something out there, that's better than not having any faith at all. That's not what Luther's talking about. For Luther, faith has a content. We talked this morning about how Luther said, you take away propositions and you take away Christianity. For Luther, faith is faith in somebody. And it can be articulated in terms of propositions. Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Christ did come to earth. He did die. He did rise again. He will return at the end of time. These are all propositions that cluster around the promise of God in Christ and prevent us from conceiving of faith, or even Christian faith, as some sort of contentless existential encounter or some sort of Oprah Winfrey trust that everything's going to turn out okay anyway. As soon as somebody tells you, as Oprah often did, that they know in their heart that it's true, you know it's false because the heart is deceptive above all things. The obvious criticism, of course, Luther faces is that this opens up the way for moral laxity. If justification before God uh, is divorced from intrinsic righteousness, what is to stop an individual claiming to be justified and then behaving as badly as they desire? If it's faith that counts and not works, why can't we just say, well, I got faith in Christ. I've received his righteousness. That's all that counts. And there's certainly force to this argument. You know that when Catholic friends still use this argument today, after four or five hundred years, that's a strong argument. Most people abandon bad arguments after a fairly short period of time. When an argument has persisted for four or five hundred years, you know it's a strong argument. Even if it's not ultimately a correct one, you know that it has a power to it. Luther certainly understood the role of the law in salvation in very negative terms. For Luther, the law, the commands of God, served to condemn sinners, to reveal our unrighteousness and our hopeless state before a holy God. The law preceded the gospel as a way of driving us to despair in ourselves. And then the gospel comes and offers Christ at a point where we are broken and in need of a Savior. So where do good works enter the scheme? For Luther, the answer was simple. Good works flow as the spontaneous, grateful response to God for his grace. 
In this regard, he sees Adam before the fall as the great paradigm of how works should be done. Adam just didn't work in order to establish his status before God. He had this status, and therefore he worked, according to Luther. Quotes, in order to make that which we have said more easily understood, we should explain by analogies. We should think of the works of a Christian who is justified and saved by faith because of the pure and free mercy of God, just as we would think of the works which Adam and Eve did in paradise, and all their children would have done if they had not sinned. We read in Genesis 2 that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Now Adam was created righteous and upright and without sin by God, so that he had no need of being justified and made upright through his tilling and keeping the garden. But that he might not be idle, the Lord gave him a task to do, to cultivate and protect the garden. This task would truly have been the freest of works, done only to please God and not to obtain righteousness, which Adam already had in full measure, in which would have been the birthright of us all." End quote. In other words, the justified person is, as it were, returned to paradise, where works are not done to make righteous, but simply because God is a great God and we are his creatures. Before leaving Lutheran, I've got a few uh, comments to make on a couple of later reformers before we, before we close. Before leaving Luther, however, it's worth uh, mentioning once again the great controversy of 1524 to 1525 in which Luther engaged with Erasmus. Erasmus, the great humanist intellectual, had been under considerable pressure from the Catholic Church from as early as 1519 to make clear his relationship to Luther. That, as I said this morning, he finally did in 1524 with his polemical work, The Diatribe on Free Will, in which he argued, among other things, I said this morning, for the basic essential obscurity of Scripture, a doctrinal minimalism, and a semi-Pelagian understanding of the role of the human will in salvation. Erasmus, of course, loves the second thief on the cross. When Erasmus talks about faith, the great paradigm for him is the second thief on the cross, because all the second thief had was a basic belief that it was going to be okay. Erasmus, brilliant New Testament scholar as he was, appears never to have reflected on that passage in Luke as he produced his critical Greek edition. As I mentioned, the second thief, he knows that God's holy. He knows that the death he faces after death is more terrifying than that which he's enduring at the moment. Uh, he knows that he deserves to die. He knows, I think you're stretching the point to say that he, think, he knows that Christ is sinlessly perfect, but he clearly knows that Christ is dying a qualitatively different and unjust death compared to that which he is dying, and he understands that Christ's death is the way to inaugurate his kingdom. That's not minimal faith. That's not minimal faith. So anyone who goes to the second thief and says, ah, yes, but Truman's given us all this doctrinal stuff, but the second thief, let's cling to the second thief here. I'd say to you, the kids I teach tomorrow morning in Sunday school, if in 25 years' time they have those five points from Sunday schools I've taught them, I will consider myself to have earned all the money that I've not been paid to teach them <laughs> over these years. That's not a bad result. The second thief on the cross actually had a remarkably profound faith, albeit articulated in an extremely small compass at the end of his life. Luther's Bondage on the Will is a long and complex book but its relevance for justification is clear. He regards justification by faith as resting upon a solid anti-Pelagian understanding of the role of God in salvation. For Luther, faith is a gift of God. And again, I think that flies against modern pop culture notions of faith. Faith is not something that you screw up and get for yourself. People say, oh, I admire him, he's got so much faith. Or, oh, I wish I could build myself up to having the faith you have. That betrays a Pelagian understanding of faith as originating in us. For Luther, faith is a gift of God. Partly because he believes fallen humanity he is completely fallen. Dead men can't muster up faith. 
Dead men don't need to screw up their faith and believe. Dead men need to be resurrected. That's the difference. Luther says this, If we believe that Christ has redeemed men by his blood, we are bound to confess that the whole man was lost. Otherwise, we should make Christ either superfluous or make him the redeemer of only the lowest part of man, which would be blasphemy and sacrilege. So Luther's doctrine of justification in some involved a number of doctrinal convictions. Sin has rendered humanity morally dead and thus impotent to effect or even assist in salvation. Righteousness is not found in doing good works, but solely in Christ. The law teaches that all have died in sin and are incapable of salving themselves. And the gospel offers the promise of salvation in Christ. And it is when the promise is believed by faith that the believer is united to Christ and receives his righteousness. So faith is not a contentless thing for Protestantism. Luther's understanding of justification, of course, finds its way into the Protestant confessions. His assistant uh, and right-hand man at uh, Wittenberg, uh, Philip Melanchthon, articulates faith and justification typically using courtroom metaphors rather than Luther's preferred marriage metaphor. And some have argued that this represents a, a, a distinct deviation between the two of them. But we actually have a, a nice letter that Philip Melanchthon wrote to uh, a, a German colleague, Johannes Brentz. I think the letter was dated 1539, when he outlines his forensic, his legal understanding of justification. And at the end of this letter, we have a postscript in Luther's own handwriting. It essentially says... I would express it differently to my brother Philip, but I agree with everything he said. So justification, faith central to Philip Melanchthon. Also, of course, for John Calvin as well. Calvin and Luther are one with each other in terms of the anti-Pelagian framework within which he understands salvation and in the declaratory nature of justification as being by the imputation of Christ's righteousness through faith. Calvin says this in the Institutes, Christ was given to us by God's generosity to be grasped and possessed by us in faith. By partaking of him, we principally receive a double grace, namely that being reconciled to God through Christ's blamelessness, we may have in heaven instead of a judge, a gracious father. And secondly, that sanctified by Christ's spirit, we may cultivate blamelessness and purity of life. Now, in my, the, the few minutes that remain to me, I want to make a, a few observations here, some of which connect what I've said now with, with what I said this morning. I talked a lot about the perspicuity of Scripture this morning. There's a huge amount to deal with on the perspicuity of Scripture. It, it rests, the doctrine of perspicuity, on a number of other assumptions. It rests upon an agreement on the canon of Scripture and the coherence of a canon of Scripture. It also rests upon an understanding that it is possible to reliably translate Scripture from Hebrew and Greek into the vernacular in a way that people who don't have Hebrew and Greek can read their vernacular translations and get the concepts that were revealed through the original Hebrew and Greek. I don't have time to deal with those today. But one of the common objections, of course, to the perspicuity of Scripture is, well, you look at Protestants, and they all disagree on a whole heap of stuff. And if Scripture is perspicuous, how come there's so much disagreement? Well, I would want to say that on key gospel elements, there is no disagreement among what I would regard as the mainstream confessional Protestants at all. Think back to Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Now, I, I've used this example numerous times. So if you've heard me speak before, you may have heard this one. But one of the things about coming to America as a foreigner, a number of things strike you. One, Americans are really hung up on diversity. They're always talking about how diverse things are. And the second thing that strikes you coming in as a foreigner is how everything's the same. Everybody talks about diversity. And generally what speaking, what they mean is skin color. Generally what is meant in America by diversity is skin color. 
Hispanic, African American, white, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Actually, the culture is pretty incredibly homogenous. I don't, there may be an olive garden somewhere in Orlando. I've never been to it, but I can direct you to the restrooms. If you care to speak to me afterwards, I can tell you where the restrooms in the Olive Garden are. Because the Olive Garden in Orlando will be built to the same plans as the Olive Gardens in Philadelphia and New York that I'm more familiar with. Wherever, I have a colleague at Westminster, he's a Chinese-American, and everybody thinks that he's the diverse guy on faculty. And then we're at a faculty meeting and somebody cracks a joke about baseball or football, American football, and everybody laughs, including him, except for me. Because I'm clueless about that aspect of pop culture. Which raises the question, of course, who's the ethnic minority in that context? I may look like a typical Californian, but I grew up 6,000 miles away. Now go to Europe in the 16th century. I would suggest to you, Europe in the 16th century is truly diverse. It is a hodgepodge of different kingdoms and principalities and territories. You can travel from Budapest to the north of Scotland and pass through goodness knows how many ethnic communities and linguistic groups. And yet in the 16th century and the early 17th century, we have this remarkable flowering of confessional documents. And there are various reasons for the production of these confessional documents. One of the remarkable things about them is how agreed they are on so many issues. You can look at the Hungarian confession, and you can look at the Scots confession. Or you can look at the Belgic confession, and you can look at the Genevan confession, and you will find substantial agreement on what Scripture means about certain issues. That's not to say they agree on everything, but in terms of the basic understanding of who God is, who Christ is, and how salvation is accomplished, there is no difference, no significant difference. And we can actually throw into the mix the Lutherans on that. It's not just Reformed confessions, it's Lutheran confessions. And you move on into the 17th century for the Great Baptist Confessions, the London Confession, the 1689 Confession. And guess what? They basically agree on what I would call the central elements of the gospel, the identity of God and the actions of God in history, and how those actions are appropriated by churches and by individuals. They agree. I think if you're going to make the case that Scripture is fundamentally confusing and perspicuous, and not perspicuous, and say you do it on the basis that, well, the Protestants in the 16th century, they were falling out all over the place. Well, yes, they were, but not on the basic elements of the gospel. They weren't. There is basic agreement on all of those things. So the central elements of the faith, there is no disagreement. Calvin and Melanchthon and Luther, they agree on justification. That is not a pointed issue between them. They agree pretty much on the incarnation. They agree on the Trinity. These things are not points at issue, despite all of the true diversity that actually existed in Europe in the 16th and 17th century. Second, and with this I will close, notice how justification by faith really is the stick of explosive that blows the whole thing apart. Justification by faith essentially shatters the need for the priesthood. You no longer need this kind of mediation of grace through the sacraments and through the priesthood in order to be justified before God. Track that forward to the present day. And I think that this is where debates on justification are not passé. Justification is the reason for Protestantism's existence, ultimately, because all of the distinctive Protestant doc uh, doctrines really devolve from justification. 
If justification is to become a doctrine that is simply negotiable, or one minor thing among many, or that the Protestant church has got fundamentally wrong, I'm going to, I mean this, and I mean this rhetorically, I'm not advising you to go out and do it, but I'm going to say we have no reason for being Protestants anymore. The positive reason for Protestantism to exist is first and foremost justification. And then as it connects to all of these issues of authority and perspicuity. If the Protestant church got justification wrong, we should all be Catholics. And that's not, I'm not advising you to go off and become Catholics. I'm putting it that way in order to highlight to you how important this doctrine is. Faith and justification are not just one doctrine among a handful of things like church order that we can agree to differ on. Justification is one of the central doctrines that determines the nature of Protestantism and the reason for the existence of Protestantism.